Hello, welcome to part two of chapter one about atoms. And in this part, we're going to look at some hist history. I'm not big on history um, because it's not something I can actually apply, but it's 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 good to understand in context what was going what this um, what these particular things state because we do still use these laws. And in order to understand them, we're going to talk a little bit about Dalton and Rutherford. We're also going to identify the subatomic particles and their characteristics, um, and you probably somewhere have been become familiar with those. So Dalton um, is like the father of atomic theory, basically, and he came up with several laws that were true at the time, but have some of them have been um, shown that that's not always the case, specifically because we can take a, nu a nucleus and destroy it. So each element composed of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from atoms of other elements. Atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds and atoms of one element can't change into atoms of another element. In a chemical reaction, atoms change only the way that they are bound together with other atoms. And this is true chemically, but not in the nuclear world, right? So several of these, um, they're not indestructible. They can vary in mass, even if they're the same element. They do combine in whole number ratios, and um, they can, though, uh, change into other things. But with what he knew and the equipment that he had to take measurements, then this was great. He did a great job. So then there were other folks that came up with different things. For example, Antoine Lavoisier formulated what we call the law of conservation of mass. Okay, the law of conservation of mass. And that states that in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created or, fill in the blank, you know it, destroyed. Okay, so you can't make matter and you can't destroy matter in a normal chemical situation. So the total mass of the substances involved doesn't change. So whatever you start with, you're going to end up with. And the law is consistent um, with these small indestructible particles. You're going to have the same number of those when you get done that you started with. Joseph Proust came up with something called the law of definite proportions. And what Proust said was that all the samples of a given compound, regardless of their source or how they're prepared, have the same proportions of their constituent elements. That's to say, water will always have two hydrogens and one oxygen. If it doesn't, it's not water. Okay? If it's, if, because if it had two hydrogens and two oxygens, it would be hydrogen peroxide. This one, great. This one, drink it and you die, okay? So it's very important, the law of definite proportions. So John Dalton also came up with the law of multiple proportions, okay? Now don't get them confused and you go back and what I do is I'd list their name and what their law was and what it said, okay? And then that way you can answer any questions that are asked about it. Um, when two elements, form two different compounds, the mass of the, the second element that combines with um, the mass of the second can be expressed in a whole number ratio. So this comes to play like um, if you have in organic chemistry, right, you can have a CH4, you could have a CH2, you could have um, let's just use that. So you could have either of those situations and they would still be expressed as whole numbers and they'll be in ratios, okay? So you can combine things with different formulas, but they have to follow very specific rules about how they are put together. And so that's why you can have 1C and 4Hs and 1C and 2Hs. Again, though, they're still different things, but you can combine those different ways. So Rutherford 
came up with some really interesting things and he really came up with a lot of the modern theory of the nucleus and um, the nuclear atomic model that we use now states that most of the atom's mass and all of its positive charge is in the nucleus. Most of the volume is empty space and in that empty space you have the negatively charged um, things called electrons. There are as many negatively charged electrons outside the nucleus as there are positively charged particles called protons inside the nucleus so that it remains electrically neutral. So if you have an atom and in its nucleus it has three protons, then it's going to have three electrons because three plus plus three minus gives you zero and you want to have a neutral charge electrically for the atom to be stable when you're talking about an element in its elemental form. So all atoms have these subatomic particles. The protons which are positively charged, the neutrons which are neutral, those are easy, and the electrons which are negative. So you have a plus neutral and a negative charge. Notice this too that your protons and your neutrons have about the same magnitude. Okay, They are just about the, exactly the same mass in kilograms. An electron is teeny tiny. Okay, Teeny tiny compared to those. It's like I'm on my bathroom scale in the morning and I'm about to weigh myself and a fly lands on my head. Well thank goodness it's not going to make me look heavier. Okay, so that's about the difference. Okay, so that is why we typically ignore the effect on mass of the electron and the atom, which means that all the mass is in the nucleus because these two are in the nucleus. And so our buddies in the math department came up with AMUs, atomic mass units, which are basically one. Okay, now I know you engineers are saying, no, that's 1.00727 and 1.00866, and that's cool, okay? But we are not sending anything to Mars, all right? When you do, then you're going to need to make sure you put that in there. And there are some calculations where we might use all of those in mass calculations. I know we do when we're looking at the nuclear um, exchanges and things like that, but for our purposes right now, one is, is perfectly fine. And then look at the mass in AMUs of our poor little electron. It really doesn't have much mass, does it? What it does have, though, is it has enough electrical charge to counteract at the positive charge of that bigger protein. Because C stands for coulombs, which is an electrical unit. Okay, there's 1.60218 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs of charge in a proton and there's actually exactly the negative of that charge negative 1.60218 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for the electron so they counteract each other and cause that overall stable element to be neutral the most important number when we identify an atom is the number of protons in its nucleus. That is by definition the element. The number of protons defines what element it is. The number of protons in an atom's nucleus is its atomic number and we use the symbol Z and Lord knows I didn't pick that okay because um, it makes no sense but the atomic number is Z and so I, I tell you that so that when we look at this little problem here We'll know what that means. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something that we're going to do in the next part. When you look at your periodic table, you should have a copy of it there. And you're going to have, in each one of those, you are going to have a little um, block. And in that little block, you're going to have a letter or two. And you are going to have a... Um, uh, some numbers, okay, and so, and and they can be different, all right, but typically you're going to see a whole number up here, 
and then you're going to see something down here that's got some decimal places. So let's say that, okay? And I didn't look at mine, so if I'm wrong, don't don't um, turn me into the periodic table jury or anything. But um, the because um, I was like fumbling here and I haven't been able to put my hand on my periodic table yet. So when we um, when we look at this, this is going to be the Z, the atomic number. This is going to be A, which is the atomic mass, okay? Now, all of the, um, all of the mass, as we saw, is in the nucleus, and it is comprised of the protons and the neutrons, okay? So, let me show you what's really cool. One of the things, one of the many gazillion things that are really cool about the periodic table is, um, I can figure out what the atomic number is, what the atomic mass is, um, and then it wants you to draw the symbol of the um, isotope with 18 neutrons. So what the heck? Okay, so this is the mass. And I said all of the mass comes from what? Protons plus neutrons. And the atomic number Z is the number of protons. So Z, the top number, is six. Now that's I'm doing this for carbon first, okay? This is asking me about another one which is chlorine and chlorine is Cl and chlorine it wants to know what the symbol is for that. Okay? And so I could I could draw it like this and I could look and I could see what is the atomic number for chlorine. Well it's seventeen and then the mass is approximately 35, right? 34.5, whatever. Okay, approximately. And sometimes you have to round these when we're doing them, um, but 34.5 is really what it is. All right, so when I'm writing the symbol for it, and it says it's an isotope, and I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Um, if we're going to draw it, we would draw it with like the C there, the mass on top, and the number on the bottom. Now how did I get that number? Okay, well I know what? I know it's number 17, right? So since I know it's number 17, I know that it has 17 protons, so its atomic number is 17. I know its mass number is approximately 35. Now, if I look at it on the periodic table, it tells me it's 34.5, I think. Okay? But I'm saying it's 35. Why? I can't have half a neutron. This number is an average, which we're going to learn how to do at the end of this chapter. Okay? This number is based on how many protons and neutrons that individual isotope has. And I said, this number comes from what? Protons plus neutrons. So it told me how many neutrons it has. It has, it has 18. Hmm. It has 18 neutrons. My pen stopped working for some reason. See if that fixed it. No. Apologize. I've never had that happen before. My pen is not doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. Well, anyway, um, so the um, I have 18 neutrons. Y'all have to bear with me. I have 18 neutrons, and I and 35 is the total. So 35 minus 18 is what? Or I sh should say 17. 35. There it goes. Minus 17, which is the number. That's the protons. Minus the number of neutrons. 
okay? So that's equal to this, so, or I should say, sorry, this has got me rattled with my pen. 17 plus the neutrons is going to give you 30, 35. So 35 minus 17 equals 18 neutrons, right? So 17 plus 18 is the mass based on the neutrons and the protons. So since you have 18 neutrons and 17 protons and most all of the mass, because the electrons are so, so tiny, then the mass would be 35. And that's for that isotope. Okay. Now, didn't leave myself a whole lot of room. So I'm going to take this little part right here and do part B. How many protons, electrons, and neutrons does chromium-52 have? All right, so we've got chromium-52 over 24. All right, and it wants to know how many protons, neutrons, and electrons it has. All right, so... I know how many protons it has because this is its number, right? The smaller one's going to be its number. So the number is the same as how many protons it has. If it has 24 pluses, I told you earlier, how many minuses does it have? 24, because it has to be electrically neutral. How many neutrons does it have? Well, one nice thing about us writing it like this is when we do this, then we can just subtract this number, 52 minus 24, and that gives me 28. And so I have 28 neutrons. So I got all of that from that one little block on the periodic table. So I gave you a practice so you can go back and watch my bumbling example that I just did and see if you can figure out how to do it. Okay? All right.